Okay. All right, let's do it. So, uh, the last time we talked, we kind of went through uh, Vygotsky's analysis of the development of preconcepts or preconceptual thought processes, mm. and today we should kind of move along into spontaneous, uh, academic, uh, true, actual concepts and some of the distinctions amongst <laughs> them. And I can tell you right from the start. Um, mm. I have a hard time deciphering if there's a difference at all between true concepts, real concepts, actual concepts. So, so sometimes the terminology gets a little mm. bit tricky for me. But what do you say mm. we just kind of leave off, uh, pick up where we left off, which was at the end of complexes and into spontaneous mm. concepts? Yeah. Look, the, the the first thing to get really straight is that Vygotsky does not have a typology of concepts. Right? His concept of concept is not which box do you put things in. Right? And you have to get that really clear. I've never heard anyone talk about Vygotsky that doesn't get involved in whether a concept is this type of concept or that type of concept. And mm -hmm. of course, Vygotsky's got it all wrong because we know that doesn't work. Uh, and they say in geometry, quadrat demonstratum, that Vygotsky's not really worth troubling with. Um, the fact is, he does not have a typology of concepts. What he has is ideal, typical lines of development. What we talked of in the other talk was that a whole bundle of lines of development uh, that uh, set up the preconditions for conceptual thinking. Right? And those together make up the, the various uh, ways in which spontaneous concepts arise. Okay? So uh, how a, a six-year-old child has the concept of brother. Right? And if you ask him, has your brother got a brother? He's totally bamboozled by this question, but he knows very well uh, what a brother is, like the uh, young woman character in Dickens's Hard Times, who cannot define a horse to the satisfaction of her school teacher, but deals with horses every day and knows everything there is to know about a horse. But she, she can't, when stood up in front of the class to define a horse, say how many teeth it has and what genus it belongs to, etc., etc. Okay, so Vygotsky contrasts the spontaneous line of development of concepts, which you'll call spontaneous concepts, because he understands concepts as the lines of development, and on the other hand, true concepts. Now, the, the true is a good word to use in some ways, but otherwise it can be confusing, right? Your, your typical contrast is on the one hand, how a child gets to know uh, something through their immediate uh, sensory motor, practical uh, uh, interactions in the home, right? and have never come across a definition of the thing. On the other hand, uh, how a child gets to know, for instance, um, the, the symptoms of some peculiar disease through a lecture uh, in the university lecture theatre, you know, or how they get to know about uh, the calculus of variations uh, by a lecture at school, and they get a verbal or symbolic representation of the thing. They walk out of the classroom, they don't know much about it, but they may have memorized a verbal definition. So what you have is that all concepts, all real concepts, actual concepts that are, represent the, the way people uh, act in, in the world, contain within them two lines of development, which in some way or other interact. On one, you have the development from uh, sensory motor practical uh, experience and, and following the way other people use words in those situations. On the other hand, you have the uh, knowledge of a concept, or a concept which is acquired beginning with a verbal definition or a symbolic definition generally. Now, any real concept has some uh, combination of those paths of development in it, okay? So, what he gives us is two ideal, typical lines of development of conceptual thought. One from practical interaction, the other from a verbal definition. They're opposite in a sense. You talk about the, the spontaneous concept which rises up from below, from the ground, so to speak, and the uh, scientific concept, uh, sometimes called true concept, which falls down from heaven. And the reality is, is this merging of the two in between. Now, I'll just explain a, a, another thing here. Um, f firstly, why did 
uh, Vygotsky talk about scientific concepts. Right? Now, you know, have to take into account the conditions of early 1930s Soviet Union, where you had no church. Yeah? Sporting associations were arms of the state, as were the unions. There was only one political party, one ideology, uh, the, the schools, the scientific institutes, um, the, the, the health services, everything was all part of one institution, the Soviet state. Right? So when you talk about a scientific concept in the context of the Soviet Union, it means a concept which derives out of that institution, an institution with thousands of years of accumulated knowledge and wisdom of the past uh, in, incorporated into it. And it, if a concept comes from there, not from uh, personal or interaction with it in that sense, uh, but uh, through uh, being given it, taught it, right, as an apprentice or a student. Right? So that's what he meant by scientific. And more than that, if you, let, let, you look at Piaget, for instance, the arch typical um, or paradigmatic concept for Piaget was the concept of basic physics. And this was very useful for Piaget's purposes because small children who have never uh, been into a, a schoolroom have concepts of basic physics. Yeah? They think if you pour, they think a tall glass holds more water than a short, wide glass, yeah? the famous things. Okay, so when they come in contact with, with science education, you have the interaction between instruction and the child's existing knowledge. Right? And that's very interesting for what Piaget wants to show, because he wants to track the, the, the level of complexity of, of the child's concepts smoothly all the way up through the ages. But it doesn't suit Vygotsky's purposes, right? because what Vygotsky knows is that, that while uh, concepts are founded in the ability of people to interact uh, with objects and other people immediately, fundamentally, concepts are, uh, are transmitters or containers or expressions or forms, whatever you like, of the wisdom of, of, of many generations. Right? Concepts are not uh, discovered by a child fiddling around in their cot with pouring water from one glass into another. Right? Uh, th th they are the concepts which are the sort of uniquely human things are discovered maybe a thousand years ago and then passed down through the generations by various means. And, and a child first comes across one of these concepts that, that were discovered by the ancestors, probably through uh, some kind of instruction, probably with a verbal definition. Now, I just wanted to check my, my understanding of one thing. When you were talking about um, concepts that are sort of loaded with cultural, historical um, meaning, passed down through the generations, you're talking about concepts along the scientific line of development as opposed to those along the spontaneous line, correct? Uh, no, wrong contrast. Uh, I'm talk talking about true concepts. That is, it, it doesn't matter whether it's the, the, the concept of the Virgin Mary, uh, the, the concept of the Year of the Dragon, uh, the, or the concept of um, of uh, plasma, right? The 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 thing is that um, knowledge. People faced a problem sometime uh, in the past, and uh, when they solved that problem, uh, the solution, the pro the problem which they identified, and the solution were encapsulated uh, in a word. Um, and a system of practice around that world and possibly also in an artifact of some kind, mm. right? If, when people couldn't work out how to put nails into a piece of wood, they invented a hammer, called it a hammer, and told people what it looked like, right? So you had a concept of a hammer. That's being silly, of course, but if you get my idea. That is then passed down the generations. Now, how, because we are language-using uh, creatures, we use language in our everyday uh, interactions, and those um, words may be signs for concepts, but when, when we hear them and when we utter them, uh, that's an action that doesn't necessarily evoke and entail the entirety of that concept that the word is a sign for. You know? It's just an action 
Uh, same as to build a house, you might say, put that brick down or whatever, or carry that uh, wheelbarrow onto site. Right? So that's one action uh, contributing towards the realization of the concept of a house. Right? And if the person giving the order or wheeling the barrow doesn't necessarily have a full concept of the house. It's just a word. So a child can understand uh, what the word means in the sense when someone utters it. And, you know, if put down that uh, uh, box of matches, they know to put down the box of matches. They don't necessarily understand why huh? or the history that the fact that their parents lost their previous house through a fire or any number of things. And they don't have to know. Huh? So all concepts, no, not so. Our life is continually coming in contact and spontaneously learning things about our world. But the content of that world is overwhelmingly inherited from the past. And what the, 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 the form in which that inheritance takes place are artifacts, houses, buildings, uh, uh, domestic animals, uh, uh, food products, uh, el you know, electronic equipment and so on. On the one hand, and on the other hand, symbols such as uh, words, and, and th those uh, artifacts, what we call artifacts taken together, uh, the form in which uh, we pass this knowledge on, this concepts on, and of course it only passes knowledge on uh, to the extent that they're used by people. Right? So when we use words and things together with other people, then other people acquire an understanding of them from us and from the things we use. So a true concept has to incorporate that element of the transmission of socially, historically acquired knowledge. So for example, if a child in Vygotsky's time is learning about feudal society, there is no chance that they've ever had personal contact with feudal society. Their, their concept of feudal society is completely a construct of what they have been taught, probably in school, but maybe from their family as well. But it comes via instruction. It may be a good concept or a bad concept. Whatever concept they've got is learned through instruction. The concept they have of brother, father, mother, uh, they, they learned before they ever went to school or ever got the definition. Okay, But it's nothing to do with science as shut. Science uh, stands for an institution. It's institutional knowledge. So the knowledge of the church does just as well. But um, for his own purposes, Piaget used the knowledge of basic physics because I think he, he, well, he saw them both as the knowledge which could be acquired by sensory motor experience but would reach its highest, most precise level, the, its purest level in the institutions of science. Now for Vygotsky, that wasn't the issue for him. Right? He wanted, on the one hand, uh, to observe the spontaneous development of concepts uh, in childhood, for example, um, and to look at the ideal typical way in which concepts come from the other direction. And he chose not basic physics, not the concepts of the you know, Orthodox Christian religion, but the concept of Marxist social science. Right? Because it, it, it's doubly obvious today that the only way you're going to acquire the concepts of surplus value and exchange value and, and capitalist and etc., etc., class struggle, is through being instructed in it. Right? You, you're not mm -hmm. going to discover these concepts by uh, personal experience. So even more than basic physics, which people can get a grasp of through their own immediate experience, people say that they, people get misconceptions, but nevertheless it's a start, it's some conception. But someone says, okay, here's feudal society. They say, what? What's feudal society? X, Y, Z, you get a definition of it, and that's your beginning. Right? So that's why I say that, that confusion only arises if you stick to your analytical philosophy and insist that it's all about types of concepts. Right? Some go in the box called scientific, some go in the box called everyday or spontaneous, and then you wonder what to do with your concepts of religion and so on. It's not what it's about. 
you, what's about is ideal typical lines of development and the development of a concept from Marxist social science is purely book knowledge. Right? Now, in its origin, purely book knowledge in its origin, of course, the, uh, the Bolshevik leader, who's a lifetime of experience and practical struggle against capitalism, you know, and, and Marxist discussion in, in every uh, different environment, uh, in many languages, say, has a far more sophisticated, mature, and developed understanding of these concepts than the school child in Stalin's Soviet Union who's just learned it in their social science lesson. Right? But the point is not the, the difference or identity of their concepts, but the, the origin and the, the path of development. Okay? One begins from book knowledge, the other begins from immediate personal interaction. Any actual concept has, its, has roots in both. Okay? I, I, I take uh, the medical student as, a, I think, to me, an abundantly clear example. Mm -hmm. A medical student who's attended all his lectures in diagnosis yeah, and, and knows the diagnostic manual forwards and backwards, then arrives at the hospital for his first uh, day as a trainee intern or whatever. And he walks into the emergency session and he's confronted with a distressed patient and all his book knowledge goes out the door. Right? He misdiagnoses, he scares the patient, he, he administers medicine which is dangerous, uh, he, he rushes off to check his books when the patient needed some comforting, etc. Okay, because book knowledge has to be somehow or other integrated. The knowledge uh, of, of, of from personal experience. At the same time, the uh, you know the an untrained person let loose in a um, an emergency ward may do better than the medical student in the first place, right? Because <laughs> they'll know to bandage things to comfort the patient. You know, a ex person with life experience can deal with emergencies quite well, but they're still hoping that the doctor will turn up. Yeah. <laughs> and stitch up the wound and, uh, and then administer the right medicine and get the patient safe, right? So neither source of knowledge is, is an adequate, is, a, is an adequate knowledge of something as, as complex as, as the human body and soul, right? But real knowledge, in a sense, the knowledge that really captures what that particular uh, activity is about, uh, medicine has its roots both in practical experience and in uh, institutional knowledge. And if you look at everyday life, for example, um, everyday life is penetrated by uh, knowledge that comes from different institutions. We, we talk about sports and all the different concepts of sports that come out of coaching and competition and all those kinds of things penetrate our everyday life. It's likewise knowledge of science when we discuss the weather. You know, we talk, I don't know if you do in America, but we talk about La Nino here, and then people know about the importance of the temperature of the Pacific Ocean and you know, the cycles involved in that. People uh, in everyday language use concepts from science, religion, sport, all the institutions whereby these uh, concepts have arisen through the tackling of specific problems and embodying solutions to these problems in forms of activity uh, associated with words, okay? So everyday life is, is not is different thing from spontaneous knowledge because there uh, we, we, we get a mixture of things, a mixture. So okay? when, when you're saying that um, concepts originated as either a, a reaction to or a problem itself in the past, mm. um, I, I know you don't want me to get too hung up between the spontaneous and the scientific distinctions. You, you do as you will, Andrew. But these, yeah, but these are problems, but these are problems that kind of arose, mm. I guess, spontaneously, if you will, and then mm. through time, over time, mm. as, they've, mm. as they've been removed from that original problematic situation, mm. They've, mm. they've become more abstracted? Is that, is that more generalized or um, to, the point where yeah. now, to the point where now they kind of come to us? Potentially in an abstract way. You take something like the Big Bang theory, or the Big Bang. Now that arose uh, through a problem of analysing and explaining uh, background radiation uh, detected coming from deep space, and that set people down a path. 
uh, which led to the Big Bang Theory. But people talk about it in an everyday way. Now, you can't say that they're different concepts, right? I mean, people know that they're talking about uh, you know, a theory of the origin of the physical universe and so on. But at the same time, they're not concepts, right? So what you have is a concept. A concept is like a city. You know? It's got a central business district, and it's got its views, but it also has the people that live there. And it also has the peculiar uh, character of the cultural life there. A concept is a many-sided thing, and it's realized in different ways. So uh, as you correctly point out, a concept arises not only a long time ago, probably, but in a specific institution. So, for example, uh, I've got a concept of, of ideal typical lines of development. Now, that is a concept which came to me through trying to understand Vygotsky. Well, it connected up with my reading of Hegel, but I arrived at that concept as a way of capturing the problem of people trying to understand Vygotsky in terms of a typology. Right? So that concept couldn't just have arisen in a, in a, in a chat down at the grocers. Right? Um, it had to arise within a particular uh, institution, as to say, like the community of people who are sharing uh, this body of knowledge and trying to clarify it and use it. Right? Um, this is true of any concept. Uh, if you if you follow the it, and it's true of concepts and we know this because it's uh, it leaves traces in word, word meaning, right? so uh, and it leaves traces in history. All these things are slightly different, but we we, we can on I know take this example freeway. Freeway was a word that came into the language in your part of the world, Anthony, in northeast America, when the, they started building these big cities and you had. Uh, urban uh, planning authorities, and you also had people that wanted to make a lot of money out of the motor car. So what they, they got together and they got this idea of, of tearing down whole suburbs and putting motorways through so that people could live out in the countryside and drive into the city. So they created a freeway. Now that was created as a solution to a specific problem. You would never have had the concept of a freeway other than that problem. Now time's moved on, but freeways are still with us. And, and they're not necessarily seen in just the same light. But nevertheless, if, if you want to know about freeways and all the, the havoc they cause and the damage that they've done to the world by creating these uh, dormitory suburbs and, and city centres without life in them and so on, uh, then you, you're going to have to get into this concept of a freeway and the problem it solved you know, and the interests that were involved in, in that. And, and then that, and of course, they, that concept exists to this day because they built them. And, and we can forget about the problem, but we've still got the things there, the big stretches of bitumen, right? which we call freeways, and therefore that sort of gives some solidity to the concept because there's a thing that we call a freeway. But really, it's a, it's a form of, of human activity. Right? So, what is the relationship? of the word freeway to this original um, building of, you know, design and building of freeway. Okay. The fr freeway is a word, is a sign for the concept. The concept is, is a greater thing. Uh, I think Vygotsky uses this metaphor, the concept is like a cloud, and, and word meanings rain from this cloud. Uh, I could, the relationship between uh, a, a word meaning and the concept is the same as the relationship between an action and an activity. Like an activity is building a house, but there are a million and one different little actions that go to build that house. Right? And then you, you can't have well, actions that aren't in any way contributing towards some activity are meaningless. Right? They're meaningless, and they can't be actions in a sense. Right? Well, words in that sense all contribute to a concept, or putting it the other way around, a word meaning, a meaningful word, the utterance of a word meaningfully, is an action which is con constitutes the realization or a realization of a concept. So concepts are realized in different ways. Specifically, they're, they're realized in discourse through the utterance of words, and as we know, we do work with words, and they're also realized in the production of things. So we, not uh, with some sense, 
we regard concepts as pointers to um, things, right? So we take a word uh, not just as a sign for a concept, but as a sign for a really existing object. Right, so we take it that freeway means that bit of bitumen over there. But that bit of bitumen over there might be a runway, or it might be something that people only know if they read history. Right? Um, it, it is only a freeway to the extent that people drive their cars down, you know, etc., etc. It's only because it's used as a freeway that it is a freeway. So really, while we use the word to indicate the thing, the thing only is what it is. It's only subsumed under the concept, which is indicated by the word freeway, because we use that thing as a freeway, right? Other than, for example, a place to have a street party. So, so for example, what would what would the relationship between the words flower and rose be? Okay, the <laughs> these words, um, because flowers and roses have, well, let's say flowers have uh, a long history of association with uh, um, human life. But I'd be, I think I wouldn't be mistaken if flower is, is actually associated with the, the horticulture, the production of gardens and so on, that it's a slightly different concept, isn't it, than, than uh, the, what we would call a wildflower. Yeah? So it is associated with the creation uh, of, of, of a, a human landscape. Now, a rose also um, is a product of a specific practice of horticulture. I believe they came from somewhere in outback China in the Himalayas, and they've been imported into Europe and America and much prized. So uh, I would say that the, the, the concepts are very much pointed to horticulture. But as you, you've indicated before, our everyday lives are so tied up with these uh, institutions of, of horticulture and appreciation of gardens and, and so on. You have nurseries that produce the things and you go down to the nursery and you buy it and fellas say, oh, that's not a rose, that's a camellia. Oh, I see. They look similar to me. Oh, well, that's a camellia and that's a rose. So it's true that the, the, the sharp edges on things get blurred uh, when the word passes into the language of everyday life. Well, but I'm not going to say that it's a, con you know, it's a scientific concept or it's a spontaneous concept, because that's really just creating confusion. What I will say is that there are two pathways to the formation of a concept of rose or flower. Now, you may be, in raising those two words together, you, you may be alluding to the fact that uh, a rose is a subcategory of a larger category of flower. And as we know from Vygotsky's work, children tend to use these words uh, at a similar level of generality. They'll say, you know, that's a flower, not a rose. And if you say, is the rose a flower, they just think they don't understand the point of the question. Right? That's a rose. It's not a flower. The flowers are over there. Right? Um, so that specific relationship, the relationship of generality, comes out of the, the, the uh, practice of classification of plants. And a child has had no uh, exposure to that kind of thing, but it's a practice which has its origin in the development of scientific biology. But because of the practice of, of beautification of homes and the creation of gardens and cities and so on, that particular science has penetrated deeply into everyday life. Right? So if we want to really explore those concepts, you've got a problem with social history a problem of, of the history of biology uh, to go into, and I, I do not have little knowledge of either subject, but th th that's what the concepts contain. The words we just use them as a sign. The sign is it doesn't evoke that whole history and complexity. But but if, for example, you happen to be talking to someone who lived in uh, Western China, for whom the roses were things that grew wild on the hills. Uh, they may have a completely different concept, and you may have trouble, even once you translate it from uh, the English word to Chinese, getting an understanding, because their concept would be different. It's what we would call wildflowers. I see. Um, well, I guess I'll transition from the idea of rose to, to romance, because the last time we talked off mm. camera, mm. Um, you, you, you talked about the idea of having, a, let's say, a relationship problem. 
in your everyday mm. life and then mm. sort of trying to develop some social knowledge or, or acquire some more formal knowledge to mm. help yourself kind of mm. learn to you know learn to conceptualize that problem can, mm. you, do you, can you talk a little bit more about uh, more about that because that was really interesting to me yeah look um we live in a, a world and i'm talking about probably the last sev several decades uh, uh what's called Ulrich Beck called reflexive society, where ordinary everyday people are to some extent aficionados of the social sciences. With so many radio broadcasts and newspaper discussions and things, people are exposed to all sorts of theories about different things. So when people have a problem in their relationship, they don't just sort of go in like a bull or a china shop and respond spontaneously. They, their spontaneous reaction after you know they've cooled down or whatever the issue may be or you know buck themselves up with a, a good cup of coffee or whatever um th they will actually go to some theoretical framework to try and resolve it and it's said that the concept stands in between the person and the object between subject and object well, it stands in between them so it doesn't stand behind the object well, it stands between them. So that if, for example, a person was interested in uh, maybe astrology, they, they may go to their astrology books and look at per, up about personality types and meditate for a while on the personality types that they think are involved to try and understand what was happening in a relationship. Someone else who may, for instance, have some interest in uh, Freud and so on, may talk to a friend or, or study in some way the literature about repression and so on come there. So um, there's, the issue is that there is a, a body of systematic knowledge that has been developed in one or another institution to solve problems. Well, the, 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 you know, Freud only developed his psychology because there, were, there was deep psychological problems around him and you know, he, he wanted to develop ways of solving them. That's the, the, it rose out of a practical problem in that way developed these concepts, passed them on uh, in a classic kind of way from one you know, therapist to the next. Um, and so it became popular. And, and because of American movies and things, uh, the, the whole world now has access to these concepts. But uh, they've moved outside the institutional framework so people will access them. Um, does that help at all? Well, there's not a cut and dried answer to your question in a sense. No, it helps. Uh, I was definitely um, thinking along the lines of something very personal, very immediate, very concrete, um, mm. that type of experience, and then trying to maybe um, abstract it a little bit or, or, or step back or mm. turn toward other sources to help. Yeah. Okay, in, Ma mainly, in any... mainly to help name, to help name something, because I always found that the, the getting knowledge from elsewhere outside of your immediate experience mm. even even if it's through conversation with somebody else mm. allows you mm. to kind of put a name on something or at least to attempt to name and then that that, that sort of removes it a little bit from the concrete and i always yeah. find that powerful yeah i think you're not alone i think it's well known isn't it that a person who's suffering from a, a minor illness but a major panic uh, gets back to a minor illness when the doctors put a name on it. Mm. Uh, and we do that ourselves. And yeah, look, to solve problems in our lives, we want to access the knowledge of uh, our forebears, don't we? The, the knowledge that's been passed on to us from the past. And we have different ways of doing that. But when we do that, we're seeking after what, the knowledge that's encoded in true concepts. And with a true concept, uh, you can... Uh, which will be book knowledge, it may be relayed verbally, that, that doesn't matter, but it's basically uh, knowledge that's passed on through texts of some kind or another. That has to interact with personal experience. So the best person to help you if you've got a difficulty is someone that has you know, a big lifetime of, uh, of practical experience with the problem and a ready familiarity with all the literature. Well, that's, so they're, they're, they're accessing both paths uh, of development of a concept and if you suddenly find yourself thrown into a problem that you're unfamiliar with uh, you've got the personal experience of it but what you're lacking is is the, the various kinds of theoretical knowledge which the society has and you can access via a book or via someone else who's read the book
But what you're doing there is looking for a true concept that will give you some kind of guidance. So, I mean, true concepts are really drawn from both concrete, Look, concrete, practical, and social abstract sort of knowledge beyond yeah. yourself. Yeah, look, I think uh, Vygotsky uses the word true in the specific sense of the concept that begins with uh, book knowledge. And I, I reserve the word actual or real, the two are synonymous in philosophy, uh, to be the, the, the concept w which contains both paths of development. A true concept, that is to say, he uses the word true because, you see, there's no smooth road from the kind of concepts that we discussed in the other talk uh, were acquired through direct experience. There's no smooth road from there to acquiring a true concept. Right? Um, peop uh, when a, a young person goes out to work, they might be, get an apprenticeship and they hooked up with a, a, a qualified electrician and they're told, you know, do X, right? Or I'll knock your block off something. Right? They, 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 they immediately come in contact with institutionalized knowledge and by working with that, uh, you know, the qualified person then they acquire that institutionalized knowledge in the form of concepts. Now, of course, in any real learning process, uh, practical interaction is a part of it. Right? But the, what makes it a true concept is that the concept they're acquiring is something that's passed down through an institution, an institution of any kind. The point about science is uh, it's uh, the, the, the knowledge which is most insulated from personal experience. Science knows that, that things don't, aren't, the truth of things is not what they immediately appear. Right? But th th that's only a relative isolation. Right? Because uh, the example of basic physics, you, you can get a certain way the concept of basic physics through personal experience. Um, and it's always there. So that what is true about a concept is what is utterly inaccessible to the person through their own efforts and can only be attained thanks to institutions which have passed their knowledge on, on. Okay? Okay, so when you said it can only be attained thanks to institutions which have passed their knowledge on, mm -hmm. but, but but don't you also need to have that knowledge grounded somewhat in the real yeah. for it to be a true concept? Uh, well, yes, it's... Am I, am I, getting, talking, am I getting nitpicky here? Because I, I'm no, all we're talking about is words, you see. Now, uh, Vygotsky was an original thinker. The words didn't exist for the, what he was trying to say. I, I don't know what you call it. I mean, uh, Hegel called it an abstract concept. Right? But that confuses people as well. You know, about what the meaning of abstract is. He called it a true concept. And also, I mean, the nature of, 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 of Vygotsky, he's, he's not a nitpicky person himself. He, he's very, uh, very particular in terms of general methodology. But in his writing, uh, he, he'll use uh, half a dozen different formulations to say the same thing. And, and sometimes very important yeah. points of, or, or, you know, I just mentioned in passing. Um, and it has to be the case because quite apart from the, the problems of manuscripts and, and, and copying and, and translation and all these issues which people are uh, concerned with nowadays, uh, and plus having to, to bridge a huge divide between uh, Marxist Hegelian philosophy uh, that he was applying to solve the problems in his work, and the fact that, that, that almost the rest of the world, particularly today, uh, work in a completely different uh, conceptual frame of red uh, conceptual frame. So he used the word true to indicate that path of development which begins from book knowledge. It, it remains a true concept for the end. So when the, the young student has done 50 years of medical practice in the hospital and practically handled every situation, they still have true knowledge. You don't say, oh, now this is knowledge just derived from practical experience because their book knowledge is incorporated, right. it's been merged with practical experience. Well, I don't know of any better word to explain that. So long as you realize you're not talking about uh, a type of concept, you're talking about an ideal, typical path of development, then the true 
ideal typical path of development is one that begins from that knowledge that's passed down in symbolic form from earlier generations and is not accessible for through personal experience. Is, is, is the question, what is a concept, a fair question? Because it seems... Yeah. Yeah, look, um, I'll take a slight sidestep on what is the concept. Okay. Uh, Tom, Thomas Kuhn, uh, you would know, uh, he's very famous uh, in, in America. He's a sociologist of science. He gave a special meaning to the word paradigm, talk about paradigm shifts and scientific revolutions. And he regarded um, science in his day, in the 1950s, early 60s, as fairly much an insulated um, institution. That, that through the processes of peer review, uh, scientists were pretty much insulated from the pressures of everyday life. Now, in that was his, his main weakness, actually, because he did not see the extent to which the problems of the wider society and the techniques and materials and technology of the wider society were influencing the development of science. Okay? Now, the way he saw science was what Hegel would call a formation of consciousness, or what Marx would call a social formation a gestalt, huh? a gestalt organized around an idea, science, namely that the, the world exists independently of us and it's knowable. Right? So that's science. Uh, now, he said the unit of scientific knowledge is a solved puzzle. Huh? The unit of the scientific knowledge is a solved puzzle. I understand Thomas Kuhn was not someone that believed in uh, sort of noumena, you know, like that knowledge is something uh, just existing in some virtual, unreal space. He understood knowledge as something practical, techniques. Huh? Um, so he says a concept is a, that's a, a unit of scientific knowledge is a solved puzzle. So that solved puzzle or scientific concept in the sense that Thomas Kuhn is, is also a unit of scientific practice. It's a unit of a social formation. Right? So every type of problem, almost every problem, but well, let's say every type of problem that arises in the development of human society, uh, at a certain point is cracked, right? And, and people realize that in order to deal with this problem, we have to work in X, Y, Z way, and we're going to call this problem uh, Z, you know, something that exists independently of human society, and, and we'll orient to it as something that's given to us, and we'll name it. Right? And then, ever after that discovery, uh, there's this problem of what Kuhn called normal science, uh, of puzzle solving, uh, of solving the little puzzles that follow on from the solution of this great big problem. Right? Now, uh, that's the, the nature of concepts. They're solved puzzles. Not restricted to science, but science uh, provided a good example. The, the, the um, problems arise in uh, sports, you know, professionalism and amateurism. At a certain time in my childhood, there was a problem because uh, footballers were having to earn a living during the week and then come and play a game of football on Saturday. And this was absurd because it was a major interest of the whole nation and these guys were getting knocked to hell. Uh, so professionalism was created mm. and, you know, uh, and so on. Yeah, th th that idea of professionalism arose as a solution to specific problems. So uh, a, a unit of, of life, a unit of a culture to be more specific, is a concept. And, and specifically, it's a solved puzzle. It's the identification of a problem which arose in a specific way of life and the naming of it and the institution of a series of related practices organized around that uh, solution. Well, so that's what a concept is. Now, it, the, as a, in, the, in the capacity of a teacher, Vygotsky knew that real conceptual knowledge can only be acquired uh, when it's a means to the solution of a problem. And this was some, uh, an insight that he used in designing the, doc the blocks experiment as well. It wasn't enough to expose people to different sets of blocks, you know, blue squares and, and red circles and big ones and little ones, and then ask them later, did they remember? Uh, it, it really was just not a useful way. But when uh, the 
subjects of the experiment had to form groups of blocks in order to solve the problem that they were confronted with, uh, th then you had some uh, the beginnings of seeing how people formed concepts. So it applies even to the uh, concepts of you know, preconceptual um, life. But uh, for example, uh, uh, the doctor is only going to understand uh, some particular distinction in the diagnostic manual when they're confronted with it uh, as a solution to a problem of understanding someone's health care. You know, but, but a, a young electrician will only understand the reason for putting the screw in this way or that way when it solves the problem. Okay, so that's what a concept is. It's identification of a problem and the solution that goes with it, or the solution and the problem that goes with it, within a specific um, system of practice or institution. Because if you don't have some system of practice, then problems never arise because people will just do something else. It's only when you have some system of, uh, according to which you, know, you work in this way or that way, it might be the legal system uh, that says you have to drive on the left-hand side of the road or the right or whatever, uh, or thou shalt not kill. No, I mean, they take the concept of murder, which in a, in a certain sense uh, was one that used to stump me because I know as a, as a member of a jury, you have to learn the various criteria that make someone guilty or not guilty of murder. So it's like a, a pseudo concept. No? But it, in that instance uh, of, of having to make a decision in a bureaucratic system, the concept has to be realized according to a tick, tick box thing. No? But even those uh, tick boxes, you know, that it has to be deliberate, one has to know what one's doing at the time, etc., etc. Um, arose because the definition of murder, um, as opposed to manslaughter or something else, uh, was solving a problem. And people had to have the concept of murder to start with in order to try and translate that or realize that in a tick box kind of way that uh, members of a jury could use to, to make their, their finding. So it's, I'll tell you something else. See, that for many years before I came across Vygotsky, it used to annoy the hell out of me that we had a political uh, and social system that's based on uh, filling out forms, tick boxes, and so on, right? That's a pet hatred of me, this phrase, it ticks all the boxes. But the fact is, to participate in the political life of the country, you have to tick the right box, you know, for who's going to rule you. You don't get to have a discussion about the policies, you have to tick the right box. When you apply for a job, it doesn't matter how good you are at the job, how much you know about it, you have to tick the boxes for qualification, et cetera, et cetera, like numbers of years experience. So it used to annoy me that, that everyone seemed to take it for granted this was what a concept was. It was ticking the right boxes. You know? Where it is blindingly obvious to me that this is the most barren uh, conception of concept imaginable. But the thing is we live in a world that's an industrial, um, bureaucratic world where because everything is dealt with by automatic processes in large numbers, um, we are required to realize concepts as pseudo concepts, or as what I call abstract general concepts, like the concept of set theory, where something is defined as being in a set according to the attributes that it has or doesn't have. So, on the one hand, we live in a world that wants to turn us all into a Venn diagram a certain demographic, a niche market, you know, where a liberal voter that smokes or whatever, therefore will get a certain sense of certain kind of advertising that says it's cool to smoke. But the reality of life is different. The reality of life is concrete concepts mm -hmm. um, that, that have this, um, uh, there are solutions to problems and they're not tick boxes. So we live in that contradiction of real human beings uh, that live in a world that is trying to box us into uh, categories. Mm -hmm. And so I first I find it particularly agitating uh, philosophers that write about concepts as if there was only one type of concept, and that was tick boxes. I have to say the one, the one thing that really sent my mind really when you were talking was, um, I, my background is teaching. So <laughs> when you talked about if you want to help somebody, um, 
develop a concept or really come to grasp a concept, the ideal way is for them to have to use that concept to solve a problem that the concept represents. Mm -hmm. And that's the only that, that just creates a really uh, compelling challenge for teaching. Um, I mean, mm. th there could be a whole framework for designing instruction just based on that, and because mm. it's and but it's it's mm. it's really hard to do, but it's really a unique, you know, it's really a unique methodology. If that's that's the but look, if there was make. no prob, if there was no problem that the child or the student could conceive of, whereby this concept would give them a solution, I mean, you have to say, what use is it to them? Of course. Now you yeah. might say that you'll need this later on. <laughs> you know damn well, so well, I'll learn it later on. Huh? That's what are well, going to say? I mean, of course, but it's... <laughs> that's, I mean, I guess in the ideal world, everything we teach is something that is relatively immediately useful, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we give people exams, don't we? So the student you, learns that they have to be able to answer the question in order to get the piece of paper to move on to the next step. So in that sense, they will struggle to understand the concept. Uh, in order to pass the exam, but the problem is a certain kind of understanding results from that. But that's their motivation. The motivation uh, to learn the concept is to pass the exam. But you know that, that they get a very distorted and barren understanding of a concept from th that methodology. So I know, look, it's not always possible uh, to write off, give someone uh, uh, get them into the problem for which the, the concept is the solution, but I think you have to keep that in mind. And, and if you, you know, I mean, this is the art of teaching. Yeah. Far be it from me to lecture a teacher about <laughs> teaching. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add? I think we're, we're, we've just about captured it. We're we're heading up for sort of 50 minutes of nattering. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've got the main points. I think so too. So, okay. Well, I have to say thanks again, and uh, it was quite a pleasure. It's a and, pleasure uh, for me as well, Anthony. Right. We'll see and you uh, from from here, you have to look out who your next victim is going to be. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> see ya. Look out. Bye. Bye.